why is suffering so important to human society? Characters, communities are forged in pathos, not in laughter. If there was no suffering, no collective suffering, maybe we'll be fighting each other. Halo teman-teman, hari ini kita kedatangan Giorgio, mantan pejabat negara dari pemerintah Singapura yang sempat menjabat sebagai Menteri Perdagangan dan Industri, Menteri Luar Negeri, dan lain-lain. Hi George, thank you so much for coming on to our show. It's a real honor and uh, you know it's a pleasure to to be able to talk to you. Uh, And I want to I wanna try to have a conversation about you, starting with how you grew up. What made you? And I know you've gone to St. Patrick, St. Joseph, on to Cambridge University and Harvard. Tell us your story. I was born a Roman Catholic, so it was natural that I should go to Catholic schools for my education. Right. Uh, as I was a good student, uh, I had reasonable expectation of a scholarship uh, provided by the government uh, that uh, sent me to Cambridge for my undergraduate studies in engineering. It was not a university I could have uh, gone to on my own because it was expensive and I didn't even know how to apply to get in. But all that was done by the Public Service Commission. And uh, we were kind of shoehorned in, onto a particular uh, pathway. Uh, I was both an uh, armed forces scholar and a president scholar. And when I came back, I was bonded to the Singapore government. I worked in the armed forces. I had my initial training with the US Army and then went on to eventually become um, a signals company commander did my staff college, was sent over to the Air Force, uh, where I was a bit of a misfit. It was a struggle getting myself accepted by the men in blue. Uh, eventually, I became chief of staff, the air staff, and director of joint operations and planning in the defense ministry. Uh, along the way, I picked up my MBA from Harvard, uh, again on a partial scholarship uh, from the defense ministry. And, and you decided to go into politics in the late 80s. And how did that come about? I entered politics at, a, at too young an age of 33. Yeah. I was not keen on going to politics before I was established uh, myself uh, and not having to depend on politics as a career. But at that time, Um, I, I was put under some pressure from both uh, Go Chok Tong, who was my minister in the defense ministry, and also by Lee Kuan Yew, who was uh, prime minister, and who told Go Chok Tong that, tell George, if he wants to learn from me, better come in now rather than wait till later. So I, I succumbed <laughs> and entered politics in 1988. You know, you've, you've done so many portfolios, right? Information, trade and industry, foreign affairs. Which, which of these would have given you the highest of challenges? And I guess I should say or ask the highest of fun. Um, I've often been asked which uh, ministry I like the most. Um, I find it hard to answer that question because each has had its own flavor, which I enjoyed. Right. Uh, but the most stressful was the Ministry for Information and the Arts. It was not a ministry which received a lot of funding, right. but it dealt with many sensitive subjects like uh, race relations, uh, censorship, um, the media, the internet, 
um, languages, religion. And it, it seemed as if at any point in time, there were sensitive issues to be managed. And if, if any was mismanaged, uh, it became a big problem. So it was a stressful ministry, which I helmed for uh, nine years. Wow. It was also enjoyable, and I made yeah. um, long-lasting friends. Uh, I dealt with librarians, I dealt with artists, I dealt with uh, those in television, I dealt with people in technology, uh, people who are in the cultural, cultural sphere. Um, yeah, that was interesting. I mean, it's, it's not important in the way that foreign affairs was important or trade industry was important, and it was always difficult to get money. Uh, yeah. But it was challenging, and to me, perhaps the most profound. You know, you've you've been referred to by many, including myself, as as a real visionary, and and you know, you've alluded to this in many talks of yours about how difficult it would have been for you to choose upon censoring, right? And, and you've always said that, you know, every country censors. It's all about the degree to which it censors, right? And, and you, you came out with the idea of jumping on this internet bandwagon. I mean, in the 90s, right? When not a lot of people were thinking about, you know, the internet, the way it's exploded, uh, you know, as we've seen it in the last 20, 25 years. Talk, talk a little bit about that before I push on you know, something related to this? Well, censorship yeah. is a, a question of balance. Yeah. As an adult, well, we resent being censored. I mean, I'm an adult, I'm mature. Why should you tell me what I sh can do or cannot do? But we're also parents. And wearing that hat, we're always concerned about the way we raise our young. So inherent in censorship is a uh, the need for society to maintain a set of balance, a set of values, and transmit these values to the next generation, respecting that they will not be the same with us, but they have to begin on a basis which we have a responsibility to transmit to them. Right. I often said, you may have, you know, uh, loot magazines in a cupboard somewhere, but you don't want it to be on the table in the living room. There are certain things you do not want presented in polite company, especially when children are around. Right. Now, when the internet came on the scene, it presented a particular challenge because it appeared as if there was now no limit and there was universal access. But I rapidly came to the conclusion that that's not true. That in the case of Singapore, it's a, it's a small country. Uh, we access media from all over the world, but the internet comes in through certain portals. And the portals can always be controlled. When I was a minister, as a matter of principle and of practice, we kept 100 sites under surveillance and censored just to keep ourselves practice that any site which becomes important, which is dysfunctional in any way, which we need to act against, we can. But there's no sense in going after small things. I mean, we yeah. be, pretend to go after small things, but the young people would be able to get around our restrictions. So it was a continuous balance. Uh, explaining this to members of parliament was not easy because many of them did not really understand the internet. All they wanted was to express their fears. And those fears had to be addressed. So it was, it was tough uh, managing that process. But I was very intrigued one year in 1996 when China sent a high-level delegation to Singapore to study the media. And they paid a lot of attention to our internet regulation. Now, this was a delegation led by a Politburo member with many ministers in it. They spent six days. They did not take time off for sightseeing or for shopping. And by the time they left, 
the new aspects of Singapore, which I as minister did not know, and it made me feel a little uncomfortable. So after I waved them off, I wondered, what was it all about? A few months later, it turned out that they were introducing their own internet policy for China. And they wanted to make some little checks before finalizing the document. So I, I tell wow. my colleagues that in a tiny way, we played a small role in China's cyberspace policy, which enabled them to create an internal universe and spawning all these companies that we know of today, like Alibaba, Tencent, and so on. But without China losing control of its own destiny, of its own internal space. Wow. I, I want to build on this uh, with, with two relevant questions. The first one is how the internet has evolved to a place where many liberal democracies are defining democracy as if it's equivalent to the amplification of algorithm, right? Which, which to me is, is, is a bit unfair because what's, what's been amplified in the internet spaces a bunch of unhealthy narratives, you know, as compared to the much more healthy narratives, which are less, if not a lot less amplified. That's, that's probably not how democracy ought to be defined, right? And, and it, the world has evolved so much. And I'm just curious as to what your view is with, with respect to, number one, whether this is a correct observation. And number two, if it is a correct observation, how do we remedy this so that we have a much more proper way of defining democracy in the context of the digital age? There was a time, a short period, when we thought that the internet represented freedom from censorship, freedom from manipulation. Uh, that period did not last very long. Very quickly, we became aware that the internet became a means of manipulating mass opinion, uh, sometimes without us being conscious of, just by the way information is either filtered or amplified. Every time I make a Facebook posting, it says, do I want it boosted? I never boost my postings. But when I see that sign come before me, I view it as a threat. Because if they can boost me, they can unboost me. They can put more friction. Across cyberspace, because of the desire for revenue, there are algorithms to create addiction. So the more you watch snake videos, the more snake videos you receive. The more you watch monkey vi videos, which I've taken interest in recently, the more monkey videos I receive. So these are algorithms to create addiction because eyeballs mean money. Yeah. And behind the scenes, there are governments, intelligence agencies, which interpose themselves. The national law say, if I intervene, you cannot tell the world that I'm intervening. That would be a crime. So that the people who are being influenced do not know. Trump was the first major politician who succeeded on the basis of his ability to make use of the social media. Right. And he became a threat to many vested interests. And now the entire social media is, is regulated, not by the government, seemingly, but by powerful people to prevent him from getting his views hmm. to the public. And he's being blocked even at the server level. Now, these are people who are not elected, but people who have decided that they will decide the views which ordinary people should receive. Now, I'm not advocating for Trump, Right. What I'm saying is, you can do it to Trump, you can do it to Xi Jinping, to Putin, to anyone you choose. And to me, that's scary. Yeah. I was in Hong Kong during the year of violence, and I came to the conclusion that Hong Kong people were being manipulated by the social media without their knowledge. And one 
month I came back to Singapore, I was asked by the police to give a talk, which I was happy to do. I titled the talk, First Demonize the Police. If you want to, de if you want to destabilize a society, the first thing you do is to demonize the police, then other institutions. It's not easy to build by manipulating the internet, but it's very easy to be destructive and to tear down. Right. And I, and I, and I worry a lot about the way we are being uh, influenced against, without our knowledge and against our will, and what all this means for democracy. Because too often now, democracy has been reduced to mass manipulation. Yeah. You no, know, in the US, it's one man, one vote. But you're not required to vote. I mean, Singapore and Australia, voting is compulsory. You're mandated, yeah. But not in Indonesia or the US. So you want to get people angry so that they vote, but you want to calm them down so that they don't vote. That's important. It, it, it affects uh, the outcome. And the US Supreme Court has determined that, yes, it's one man, one vote, but freedom of speech is also freedom to spend money on speech. <laughs> So if you're a billionaire, you put in a billion dollars in a super pack, you can influence people. Right. But you have no money, you have the wrong chili, you have no voice. So what does democracy mean? So it's not a yeah. panacea, it's a much more complicated subject yeah. than what it's often presented as. You know, you've, you've mentioned the fact that the digital age has helped with respect to the disruption, if not the corrosion of institutions and also institutional building. I wanna, I wanna take this to the personal health of the human being, right? I, I read this book that talks about the four digital villains. The first being the digital deluge, the deluge of information. The second being the digital distractions. The third, being the digital dementia and the fourth being the digital deduction you alluded to this how humanity is being reduced right and and this you know has repercussions on a personal health of a human being by way of just those four identified you know digital villains i'm curious what your views are with, with respect to this the technology itself is neutral. It can be used for good or for evil. We teach children from a young age how to handle fire. If they get it wrong, they hurt themselves, they can hurt themselves very badly. You teach, we teach people how to use knives and firearms. They can be used for good, they can be used for evil is the same with digital technology. But in our education system today, in our business schools, we don't talk very much about the moral dimension of the technology. We can't say, look, I only teach you how to use, how to use a knife. How you use it, that's your problem. I'm not interested. We should be interested because that knife can kill. Yeah. It can be very destructive. It's important from a young age that we teach students and that we are aware ourselves of the moral dimension of this technology that has come before us, which can be very useful, which can liberate people who would otherwise be wheelchair bound, bedridden, isolated, but who can now, through this technology, access the universe and be productive. There's a lot of good in it, but there's also a lot of evil in it. Yeah. And we should discuss this moral dimension. Wow. Well, we, we, we can go on and on on this uh, topic of, you know, the digital villains, right? And, and how they have eroded morality of humanity i i want to i want to try to switch topics here if if you don't mind i'd like to go around the world and take your view on 
on the geopolitics of things, right? Uh, let's, let's start off with what's happening in Ukraine and, and how you think this will have repercussions on the day-to-day -day life or livelihood of people in Southeast Asia. Walk, walk us through this. Well, I, <clears throat> I take a historical perspective. The collapse of the Soviet Union, beginning with the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989, uh, had huge repercussions on the entire world. There was a period when the US thought itself as the new Rome in the unipolar world, then led to hubris. And after September 11, to a series of wars, which ended with the ignominious withdrawal of NATO forces from Afghanistan. Ukraine represents a long tail from the collapse of the Soviet Union. Despite verbal promises they made, NATO kept expanding eastwards. And they were happy to see Russia being reduced uh, into a power to be pitied, to be helped, to be patted on the head. But it created within Russia itself, and the Russians are great people, who said, no, no, we will retreat no further. So Ukraine became as it were, a stand that they felt they should make. That if Ukraine went to the Western camp, next would be Belarus, and after that, Russia itself. This is how Putin sees it. Last July, he wrote a long essay on the common history of Ukraine and Russia, because Russia began in Kyiv. It began with Vladimir, who, when he converted to Christianity, chose Constantinople over Rome. And interesting that Zelensky and Putin are both named after Vladimir, the case of Zelensky Volodymyr. So the history of Russia began in Kyiv. And this doesn't mean that just because you have a common history, so we are forever trapped in the same country. But the history is important because it determines how people behave. If you are France or Germany, you have long experiences with Russia. I mean, during COVID, I had time to read War and Peace. Right. After Borodino, the Tsar evacuated Moscow. Napoleon entered into an empty city, which was set on fire. A year and a half after that, Tsar Alexander was in Paris. On 22nd June, 1941, Operation Barbarossa, one of the largest offensives in right. human history. By April 1945, the Red Army was in Berlin. Berlin. So if you are a European, a Western European, you say, boy, you got to live with Russia. But if you're an Eastern European who had to suffer under the heels of the Soviet Union for many years, Russia cannot be small or weak enough, and you want the U.S. to be there. Now, the U.S. has its own agenda. I mean, Lord Ismay, the first Secretary General of NATO, made, said, uh, made those famous words that the purpose of NATO is to keep out the Soviet Union, keep the U.S. in, and keep the Germans down. Or oh, in some ways, <laughs> that, that consideration has not changed. Right. So there are divergent views. And Ukraine, the poor Ukrainians are now caught in between. The tectonic plates collide. And which is why it's very important for clear leadership, knowing the history and being clear what is a feasible space for the future. It's very dangerous to build hopes and illusions because it leads to tragedy. So on Ukraine, Putin has crossed the Rubicon. He cannot lose. He cannot yeah. afford to lose. Yeah. The Americans 
don't want to see him win. So I'm, I, I fear that this will be a long struggle and it may lead to a partition of the country for a long time to come. No, in 1974, the Greeks on Cyprus wanted Enosis, which was union with Greece. The Turks on that island were naturally opposed. And this led to Turkey's invasion and the partition of Cyprus, which continues till today. Today. Yep. And the Greek part has joined the EU, but there's still a, a dividing line, and it is tragic. I fear that unless we learn from history, such a fate may also be for Ukraine for decades to come. Yeah. It, it just seems very tough to try to reconcile. On one side, call it ideology. On the other side, strategic security interest, right? The NATO's and the EU's and the US's interest in preserving the ideology in the context of Ukraine and Russia's strategic security interest on the other side. Now, to the extent that it gets long drawn, right? I mean, the possibility of this becoming nuclear cannot be precluded. I'm just not sure how that's gonna impact upon many people around the world. How do you see this unfolding in, in, in call it the base case scenario, as opposed to the best case, if not, pessimistic scenario. It's very sad. We thought that we left all that behind us with the end of the Cold War. But the, the demons of the past have come back to frighten us, to haunt us. Russia knows that it cannot compare to Europe or to America and definitely to, not to the combined West in terms of economic power. So all it has is weaponry. Right. And that if you push me beyond a certain point, I can hurt you militarily. It's come to them. Yeah. Years ago, I remember Kissinger saying, if you want absolute security, that means my, my absolute insecurity. Yeah. So stability is achieved by a balance of insecurity that there are risks if I push too far. And this idea that a country has a natural and an irredeemable right to decide on its own security arrangements, I think deny that very principle that our securities are intertwined, that there has to be a relationship, right. that there has to be a compromise. Without yeah. compromise, we'll fight to the end of time. And I hope we have learned from the mistakes, the tragedies of the past. And I don't like the way the nuclear option is being talked about in a cavalier way, not just in Europe, but even in Asia. Right over Taiwan, the South China Sea. I think it's madness. And we were directly affected through register of strong objection. What, what can we do better, if not more, to <clears throat> maximize the probability of that sort of a compromise? taking place in the most realistic manner and in the most expedient manner? Well, for us in Indonesia and Singapore, I think we have to be realistic. We, 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 can't, yeah. we can't change the world. Correct. But we have influence over the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, that we can do. Yeah. And Indonesia plays a particularly important role in ASEAN. If ASEAN is vital, if ASEAN is united, not in a rigid way, but in a soft, uh, 
cultural way, then it becomes a very important piece holding larger Asia together. Today, only ASEAN can convene all the powers together. Russia, the US, North Korea, South Korea, India. We can do that in ASEAN because we are ASEAN. Yep. Because we are not threatening because we don't have nuclear weapons. We don't have ICBMs. So we're acceptable. No one else can do it. Yep. So we have to preserve this space and pre prevent civilization from being balkanized. And Indonesia is a large part of ASEAN. It's 40% of its land area. It's over 40% of its population. And it will soon be 40% of its GDP. Yep. So Indonesia's role is critical. If Indonesia takes the lead, the, when I say lead, I mean in a Javanese sense, of yes. leading by restraint, <laughs> not by yeah. arrogant assertion, Sure. then ASEAN can cohere. Mm. ASEAN in all its diversity will find a higher unity. And the rest of the world, the major powers, we have to take cognizance of it. Which is why I think if we put our shoulders to the wheel, we can make ASEAN a factor which no major power can ignore. And this in turn will help improve the chances of peace and resilience in the region. That's, that's, that's a good point. And, and I want to take this further. It just seems to me that at the rate that the United States is allocating so many resources into Russia slash Ukraine, just within logic, it just seems to be misallocating the resources that it needs to be allocating more towards China or with respect to China, which clearly is the second largest economy, soon to be the, the largest economy. How does that bode for all of us in Asia Pacific, right? Which needs the balance, if not the balancing between two great powers at the rate that we're going to lack or miss this duality, our bargaining leverage is going to be diminished. Well, this is part of the nature of the U.S. Yeah. The U.S. is a relatively young country. It has only two neighbors which it, over which it is dominant. It's flanked by two oceans. It never had centuries of having to deal with a complex array of neighbors, some friendly, some not so friendly, some openly hostile, which is China's history. So when China deploys its statecraft, it takes the whole picture holistically. In the US, the checks and balances create a fragmented power structure. So different groups have different objectives. Right. You're right. If your principal concern is China, well, concentrate on China. If your principal concern is Russia, concentrate on Russia. Why direct limited resources to both at the same time? Unless you, you're so confident of turning Russia around that you think that, well, I take Russia first and then the entire West will be against China. That's not going to happen. And even China, I mean, those of us in the region, the history of China in our region goes back to the beginning of history. You know, before there, were, there was any significant kingdom in Southeast Asia, the Han Dynasty had already plotted the meridian in the Java Sea. Right. So the kingdoms, the countries of Southeast Asia have seen China in its many cycles. So the nature of China is not unknown to us. We know how that China will behave when it becomes strong and powerful again. There are certain things it will do. There are certain things it doesn't want to do. China is not interested in conquering other countries and incorporating their population because 
they find non-Chinese people hard to manage. China today is 1.4 billion people. It's over 90% Han. And this is not by accident. This is by policy. It's by yeah. policy. They do, want, they do not want to incorporate too many non-Han people yeah. into the realm. It's just too difficult for them. So the way they deal with the world outside is what countries agree to in Bandung, mutual non-interference, right. mutual benefit. We don't try and convert each other to our religion or to our political system. Live and let live. Cooperate yeah. where we can, have regard for each other's security. But the US finds it very difficult to see China in that light. And therefore, I, I fear that for a few decades at least, there'll be a trial of strength. And the US will not e easily be convinced by China's rhetoric that he has no wish to be a hegemonic power. Because the US in its own history assumes that China will have a similar history when it becomes dominant. So we're in between. And in a sense, we have to be peacemakers. Right. Because if there's no peace, we'll be dragged into the conflict. Interesting. You know, let me take this further. We've, we've seen how the, the global order has shifted from a bipolar to a unipolar and now to a multipolar. Call the unipolarity starting off whether it's 89 or 91, but it kind of like dissuaded over time. And now we're seeing a much more multipolarized world. And, and I've, I've been hypothesizing that the reason why the world has been able to multilateralize it would have been significantly on the back of how the world or the global order was so unipolar. Ironically, or paradoxically, at the rate that the global order is becoming more multipolarized, it's actually more difficult now for the world to multilateralize, right? As we've seen in the last few years, we've seen sort of like a decline of multilateralism. And that seems somehow correlated with the way the world has gotten more multipolarized. Whereas multilateralism was a lot easier when the world was unipolar under the dominance of the United States. How, how would you view that? Is, is that the right line of thinking? Well, for a few centuries, the West erupted out of its own continent to dominate the entire world. Yeah. The fact that we're speaking to each other in English is because of the Western ascendancy. In many of the things that we do, in the standards we employ, in the terminology uh, we are acquainted with, many of these things are derived from a dominant West. Now, that dominance is receding, relatively speaking. It's not that the West is in decline. The West is in relative decline. Right. McKinsey puts out regular forecasts of the world in 2050. The biggest economy will be China. The second will be the US or India. The fourth will be Indonesia. It's just the logic of numbers and the fact that we are catching up on technology and organization, but we have our own ancient cultures. And increasingly, we who are non-white, we then being lectured to by the West, being told that we are not meeting their moral standards. We need only to recall what happened during the colonial period to reject that intellectually. Right. But emotionally, it's not so easy because we are being fed by popular culture, by the international media of what is right and wrong. And we grew up seeing Western standards as higher standards. 
So this period is wrenching for everybody mm. because it's transition. Yeah. So when we talk multipolar multipolarity, it's not only the military, political, and economic sense. It's also in the cultural sense. Yeah. And that we should not be used to being told what is right and wrong by people who are not like ourselves. And it's hardest for the West because for the first time in a long time, people are standing up to them and looking them eye to eye and saying, no, I disagree with you. These are not universal standards. These are not universal rules. These are your rules. Let's talk about them. So there is some degree, if not a high degree of revisionism, right? With regards to number one, the global order, and number two, the role of the East that's expanding relatively, as you aptly pointed out. How, how do you see this revisionism fair going forward in the next few years? We, we have to get used now to a world which is not as coupled yeah. as it was in the past. It's a little like COVID. You know? COVID has forced us to erect borders again and to shut doors and to control entries more tightly. And it's frustrating because we were used to free movement mm. before that. I think politically and culturally now, we've got to get used to a world which is fragmented. There's a the US, there's Europe. Within Europe, there are different centers, each proud of itself. In Asia, there's China, but there's also India and there's Indonesia. And within Southeast Asia, no one wants to be bossed around by anybody else. Yep. A kind of an acceptance that, yes, you are bigger than me, but we are morally and spiritually equal. And our relationship depends upon mutual respect. I think this is a period where we have, we've got to go back and appreciate each other, understand each other in his history and in his culture. And not, and not just as economic statistics. Yeah. How, I wanna, I wanna push on this. Uh, you know, alluding to, you know, to borrow the, the concepts of Neil Ferguson of the six killer apps you know, which are competition, work ethic, modern medicine, science, consumerism. I lost track of the six, but these are basically the killer apps that the Western civilization has been able to succeed upon in the last few hundred years. But every one of these six killer apps, we're seeing sort of a relative decline you know, within the context of the Western civilization, be it competition, work ethic, science, consumerism, medicine, you name it, oh, property rights, which basically dovetails into, you know, enforcement of rules and regulations. I wanna, I wanna build on this. As much as we'd like to believe that the East is thriving better on many, if not all of these, you know, six killer apps. There are paradoxes, there are paradoxes, right? It's, it's not, I think it's a lot easier said than done. We in the East have our own weaknesses. And I, I can point out to some democracies in the East, which have, their own weaknesses in terms of their inability to democratize talent as a result of which we can't compete, as a result of which we don't have the kind of work ethic, we don't have the right instrument to advance medicine, science, and all that good stuff. So I'm just curious as to what your views are with respect to how the six color apps are moving or shifting and what the East civilizations you know, would have to figure out what to do going forward. I'm, I'm kind of all over the place here, but I, I think you get my point, right? It's, 
it could boil down to how we take a view on each one of these six killer apps that the Western civilization has thrived, if not succeeded upon. Well, to me, all these uh, apps are uh, means to an end. Right. Uh, they're not ends in themselves. Right. Uh, what you want is for human beings to be able to live as social beings in harmonious relations with fellow human beings to raise the young and not to marginalize people. We can't be happy. I, I was listening to the BBC just the other day and there was an expression that a mother is only as happy as her most unhappy child. The mother is a natural socialist. Those who are doing well, she's happy, but her mind is always on the weak, on the sick, the one who's suffering. And a child's retarded, she gives it extra attention. To me, the measure of a quality of society is how it treats those who are at the bottom, who are marginalized. Right. You cannot judge a society by its billionaires, you know, mm. by the cars they drive, the, the, the wines they drink, the restaurants they go to, the private jets that they, they fly in. No. I say, look at the bottom. Are there homeless people on the streets? Are there beggars? Are there groups who are kicked around as if they're not fully human beings? Beijing, Shanghai, Jakarta, Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, London, Paris, New York, San Francisco. I use it as my ruler. Democracy to me is complicated. It's a means, not an end in itself. The end is the mother. The mother is only as happy as her unhappiest child. And a society should only be able to feel itself a good society if those at the bottom are properly looked after. Not to be dragged down in a procrastinate equality, which was what China was in the past, but one which allows us to flourish as good human beings, to be at the limit of our potential, but which requires us as human beings to look after other human beings. But I'm not familiar with what uh, Neil Ferguson wrote, but to me, unless you talk about these other issues, yeah. those yeah. other things are not important. Yeah. But those other things are important in order to achieve these core issues of what it means to live in human society. Let's, let's, uh, no, and I'm, I'm with you. Uh, those are means to an end. And, and I agree with you that, that at the end of the day, we've got to humanize, you know, the things that we want to be. I want to, I want to talk about humanity. I want to talk about what it takes to be happy, right? And, and, I know you're working on a book, and, and I've, I've read your earlier book, Bonsai, Banyan, and Tao. What, what makes a person happy from your perspective? Or what, it, what does it take to be happy? Let me... In, invert that question. Yeah. Uh, why is suffering so important to human society? Characters, communities are forged in pathos, not in laughter. It is when a people suffers, when a human being suffers, that something in him is forged. Yeah. My younger son had to fight for his life because of leukemia, which relapsed twice. And in the end, he was saved by a bone marrow transplant. When I was newly married, I had plans for a family, what we would do, 
uh, all the plans came to nothing because all attention was focused on saving him. And the, the entire, the life of the entire family was distorted because of him. Is it something to regret, to lament over? No, how can it be? Because he's alive. He's not a junior doctor. And I watched his siblings. They are close to one another. If there was no suffering, no collective suffering, if life was all about luxury and travel and skiing and choosing between cuisines, maybe we'll be fighting each other. So when you look at a society at a tribe, always look at the suffering. And in the suffering, you find his character. And strangely, it is when we have that character that we are able to understand the world with all its problems. And only by accepting the world for what it is and setting it in context, can we be happy. If happiness is just pleasure, it's ephemeral. It would quickly lead to the opposite. But if happiness comes from an understanding of why we are human, from accepting the world for what it is, from being in the flow of things, that is a philosophical happiness. And I think that happiness is almost spiritual. It's, it's also accepting the non-permanence of a state, right? That, that's, that's basically what it takes. I mean, people that are less happy or unhappy are usually those that do not accept the non-permanence of a particular state. They think that it's permanent, which is why there is a dissonance between expectation and reality. And, and, and I agree with you that I think taking one to the end of the spectrum, call that suffering, makes you a lot more cognizant of what it takes to be less unhappy. And sometimes it is by helping unhappy people that we achieve yeah. our greater self-satisfaction. Yeah. If, if our preoccupation is just our own wellness, it's superficial and I, it, it cannot endure. It's just going to a spa. Right. But the, the joy that comes from lifting someone up or making a difference in another person's life or feeling yourself useful, that is deep. So happiness cannot be divorced from our relationship with others. Yeah. Although sometimes we feel that we are happier when we are rid of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think there's an illusion. <laughs> yeah. What, what keeps you busy now? Uh, I know you're working on writing something amongst many other things. Is, is that what's preoccupying you now? Well, I'm semi-retired. I'm on a few boards. I, yeah. I'm advisor to various companies. I, I help uh, various universities around the world. Uh, but in the last one year, I've been preoccupied with working on a, a book of musings. Uh, it was supposed to be an easy effort. Someone comes to my <laughs> office and, and after 10 series of interviews, he write it up and it's done. Uh, it, it's nothing like that because I discovered that my thoughts were all over. So I started writing before the weekly meeting, spent 10 to 12 hours. Wow. And, and this went on for six months, everything written down. Sorry, 10 to 12 hours in a day? In a week. To in a week, To okay. prepare Sorry. for the weekly okay. interview. Okay. This went on for six months. 
And then the chapters were too long. The publisher said, no, no, you have to pick up the chapters. So I'm rewriting all of them. And in the process, what was intended as one book has become three books. <laughs> uh, but they're musings. They are, it's not an autobiography. It's not a memoir of my public life. It's a mixture of things big and small. Uh, and and it's, it's me talking to you. And you may be interested. I may be interesting. I may not be. I can talk to another person on a different subject. So it's just a series of such conversations, as it were. Yeah, and, and but it's, it's easier said than done. It's, it's, it's an enormous effort. If I knew how much was involved from the beginning, <laughs> I would never have embarked on it. But now I'm more than halfway through and I look at, I look forward to finishing that journey. <laughs> you you want to give us a sneak preview on anything that might be relevant to us in Southeast Asia or in Indonesia? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I talk about um, my, my early childhood, my parents, my, about my parents, uh, visiting my grandparents in China, uh, what being Chinese, what being Christian uh, mean to me, uh, what being Singaporean uh, means to me. Uh, I talk about uh, uh, various communities in Singapore, the Eurasians, I talk about India, my involvement with Nanana University. Then I have uh, ch chapters reflecting on Chinese culture, Singapore's Chineseness, Chinese education. And I talk about Hong Kong. Uh, that's, that's in the first volume. In the second volume, I talk about my work in the Vatican, uh, my meeting with the three popes. I talk about the Vatican's relations with China. I talk about Islam, uh, Islam uh, in the struggle. Uh, I can't use the word jihad because that's, that word has been captured by others. Right. Uh, talk yeah. about Islam in uh, its diversity while still remaining one Ummah. Then I talk about Europe, my education there, my travels there, my work there. I talk about Europe cresting and its dominance of the world. Then I talk about the US, uh, my education there uh, in Harvard, my education there as a young military officer. I talk about how three members of my family had serious illness and they were safe in America. Then I talk about my involvement as a minister of the US, the free trade agreement, various other things. Then I talk about with the Pax Americana, you know, how long will this endure? Can it endure? What happens when China becomes the dominant economic power? Will the US still be primus? Inter Paris, you know. Then the third series, I talk about uh, WTO trade negotiations, uh, my work in information and culture, uh, my experiences in SCF. I talk about God. I talk about Lee Kuan Yew. I talk about Tai Chi, Qi Gong. I talk about uh, life and its meaning, and I end it with a prayer. <laughs> so it's a, wow. it's a kind wow. of a, all over. <laughs> And, and this is this is coming out at which year? This year or next year? The first series will be out at the end of August. Okay. The second will be before Christmas, and the third early next year. I'm, I'm definitely going to get my copies. <laughs> you, you may find it too much of a jumbo. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, at, at the end of each episode, I usually ask... You know, after we talk about, you know, their background and their views of the world and, and state of, you know, everything, we talk about how they envision the future, right? We usually end up in the year 2045, which, you know, by your standard is, is short term. <laughs> but for most people in Indonesia, it's long term. What or how do you think Southeast Asia would look? In 2045, you know, having seen everything that's been happening throughout your multi-dimensional, you know, career. I read Chinese history a lot. Yeah. Uh, I also read Southeast Asian history. And it's always been that every time China was um, united, it, it had the world's biggest economy. 
and it created a huge China trade, which sometimes kingdoms in Southeast Asia fought over. So the, the historians now believe that the reason why the Cholas destroyed Sri Vijaya a thousand years ago was because of the trade of the Southern Song, which was very lucrative. Mm. I believe uh, China's rise will bring a new era of prosperity to Southeast Asia. As a general idea, but it requires infrastructure, it requires education, but most importantly, it requires uh, proper management of relationships. So the Southeast Asia is a complement to China and not an arena of proxy struggle uh, between China and other major powers. And that requires uh, a strategic view of ourselves in that future. It requires leadership, it requires diplomacy. And in all of that, uh, Indonesia's uh, role is, uh, is, is necessary. It's not sufficient in itself. Indonesia, we have to work with others. Yeah. Uh, and, and Singapore and Indonesia have always had good relations. So I think we should work together. And our views are mostly aligned anyway. Uh, it requires Indonesia to play a major role. And if Indonesia does not, uh, Southeast Asia will be weakened. Yeah. Indonesia's own future will be jeopardized by that. How, how do you see Indonesia playing a more major role? What, what is it that we could remedy to be perceived as playing a more major role for purposes of that end game in 2045? Last night I was writing my chapter on Indonesia yeah. and I was reflecting on uh, Sukarno. When I was uh, in primary school, we had to tape the glass windows because of bomb blasts. And even after September 1965, mm. uh, relations were not patched up. Uh, but many went back, went up and down. Then Lee Kuan Yew hung the two Marines. Which, which caused our embassy in Jakarta to be ransacked. But Lee Kuan Yew knew how important Indonesia was. And he asked our ambassador in Jakarta that every speech Suharto made, he wanted a voice cassette sent back to him because he wanted to listen and practice his Bahasa Indonesia before his first meeting with Suharto in 1973. When he went there, he went to Kalibata, he, he scattered rose petals on the graves of the two Marines. And he had a good meeting with Suharto. And after that, that friendship between him brought the two countries close together. As a young military officer, I got involved. Right. I remember our first exercise over Sumatra, Air Force exercise, Elang Indupura how nervous all of us were. But year by year, the relations grew, became intimate. Then 1998, the world changed. And the succession of presidents, Habibi, Kurs Dor, Megawati, SBY, and now Jokowi. So I made short reflections on each of them and how Indonesians and Singapore, our destinies are intertwined. When I was in government, the country I visited the most was Indonesia. And I always believed that among all countries in the world, Indonesia is one of the most important to us. Now, I don't expect Singapore to be that important to, to Indonesia, but I always remember what, what Benny told me, that when he spoke to Lamhana students, he told them, if Indonesia was threatened in Papua and Singapore was threatened, in which direction should Abri, now TNI, focus his attention? His point was not Papua, it should be Singapore. So Singapore has some importance in Indonesia and this bilateral relationship is very important and we should work together to strengthen ASEAN. It's, it's, it's vital for our future. And it can be a very bright future provided we get the basics right. 
And, and this would have been the great Benny Murdani that you're alluding to, right? Oh, yes, about Benny. Yeah. Yes, yes. I still have his golf balls, you know, with four stars on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you a couple of last questions. And, and this relates to the centrality of ASEAN, which you've been a very big proponent of. How, how do you see the, the centrality of ASEAN right now compared to how it would have been some years ago? It's a paradox. ASEAN is central yeah. only because it is weak. Yeah. If ASEAN were strong, were rigid, ASEAN cannot be central. Yeah. Because we, however strong we are, we are a minor piece on the larger chessboard. But we play a different role. We play a role as convener of bringing people together, of being a buffer in the region where tectonic plates meet. Yeah. And because we are flexible, so we can take shocks, we can take earthquakes. And in that process, help the tectonic place, help the big powers. Yeah. So this requires us not to have an inflated view of ourselves, you know, to think that we can pronounce on others and take positions. I think that's unwise. ASEAN is strongest when it's soft. Not when, it, not when it is hard. Being soft is an essential quality of ASEAN. And this, I don't have to tell Indonesians because it's so much a part of our culture. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, I'm gonna save the second question for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I think I've just figured out that you've actually answered my second question. This, this has been wonderful, George. Any, any, any final messages you have for, for all of us here in Southeast Asia that would be enduring? <laughs> we should, the waters are relatively calm now. Yeah. They will become choppier. And we, we may run into a storm. We should not think that the, the current calm will last forever. Yeah. We should make use of the calm now to prepare for the storm. I think the storm will come in one way or another. So this is the calm before the storm, not the storm before the calm. I was hoping you'd say <laughs> the storm before the calm. <laughs> oh, after the storm, there'll be a greater calm. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. Okay. Thank you so much, George. Thank you, Gita. What a pleasure. And salam sehat. Yeah. Salam sehat. Yeah. Teman-teman, itulah teman dekat kita, Bapak George Hill, mantan Menteri Luar Negeri dan mantan Menteri dalam beberapa portfolio lainnya dari pemerintah Singapura. Terima kasih.